morning, everybody. A very warm welcome to this morning's webinar, which is our construction law uh, summer update. My name is Stefan Harris Wright. I'm a partner in the construction and engineering team at Burkitt Solicitors. So this morning's session is being uh, presented in conjunction with the Chartered Institution of Civil Engineering Surveyors, as you know. Uh, many thanks to the CICES for inviting us to uh, present to you this morning. If there are any uh, regular viewers amongst you, then you'll know we've done quite a few of these sessions um, for the membership over the years. We're always very happy to do so and, and grateful to be asked back. If we could have the next slide, please. So the theme for this morning's session is uh, the title we've given it up there on the slide, which is effective management of payments, claims and delays in an uncertain market. So um, as construction lawyers, we're, we're finding an increasing number of clients are coming to us for advice on construction claims, whether that's due to sort of general pressures on the market, due to you know, shortage of, a, of, um, of materials and increased materials costs or whatever it might be, other factors too. Um, we thought it would be useful to summarize some of the issues <coughs> excuse me, that we're seeing arising in these, um, these scenarios uh, with a view to hopefully giving you some kind of useful hints and tips on how to avoid claims and also protect yourselves in a, uh, in a claims situation. If we could have the next slide, please. So hopefully most of you will have heard of us before, but just in case you haven't, there's some information for you at a glance on this slide in case you want to review it afterwards. But uh, in summary, we are a full service top 50 UK law firm with six offices across the UK in the east of England, London and in Kent. And as part of our firm, we have a specialist construction an engineering team who advise on transactional and contentious uh, construction matters. If we could have the next slide, please. So I wanted to take the opportunity now to briefly introduce our speakers this morning. So I'm joined by Katrina Breton, who's a senior associate in the construction team. Uh, we also have a guest speaker this morning. We have Richard Devoy, who's a director at the construction consultancy planning manager. Uh, Richard is an accredited expert witness and he specializes in construction programming and delay analysis uh, and also joined by another of my colleagues John Fawcett. John is um, also a senior associate in the construction team who specializes in advising on construction disputes. So good morning and welcome to all of our panel. If we could have the next slide please. So just to kind of briefly summarize for you um, the content for this morning's session so Katrina is going to talk about payment and construction contracts and with a particular focus on the statutory scheme for payment under the Construction Act, um, but also how that's reflected in the two most popular industry standard forms of contract in the UK, which are JCT and NEC. Uh, then Richard's going to give us an introduction to some key concepts and principles behind delay analysis. And then finally, John's going to give us an update on some recent interesting and significant cases in the construction and engineering space. There'll be an opportunity for um, questions at the end, so you can put questions to our panel through the questions function in the GoToWebinar portal. Um, questions come through to me and to um, the panelists, but not to the wider delegation, so you will remain anonymous, so please don't be shy. Um, a few people have sent through questions in advance, which is great. Many thanks for those. Uh, we've had a brilliant turnout, actually, for this morning's session. I can't promise we'll get through all of the questions in the time, but we'll certainly do our best. One other thing to mention is that we've got some polls uh, during the course of the session for you to participate in, just to add a little bit of audience participation. But again, those are anonymous, so please do have a go. Um, and you'll see those coming through as we work our way through the session. And then we'll look to draw proceedings to a close promptly by sort of midday at the latest. Final kind of housekeeping point, uh, the session is being recorded and will be circulated to delegates afterwards along with a copy of the slides. If we could have the next slide, please. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Katrina for the first part of the session. Thank you, Stefan. Good morning, everyone. So I am going to talk to you, as Stefan said, about payment in construction contracts, concentrating on the scheme and how that's interpreted in the standard forms. Can I have the next slide, please? 
Okay, so starting off looking at the statutory regime, by the 1990s, the government had recognised that construction was somewhat of a broken industry. It took on board key recommendations from various industry reports, which ultimately led to the creation of two new pieces of legislation, the catchily titled Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act, which we know as the Construction Act, and the Scheme for Construction Contracts England and Wales Regulations, which we know as the Scheme. Both of these came into force on the 1st of May 1998. Now, the legislation applied to all constru construction contracts, which were defined to include contracts for the provision of construction works or services at any level of the supply chain. Aside from a few exceptions, such as contracts relating to PFI, um, power stations and also supply only arrangements. Concentrating on payment, the legislation requires that construction contracts include an adequate mechanism for determining what payments become due and when. This introduced the concept of the due date for payment. Uh, now, bizarrely, it's not actually the date on which a payment becomes due, but it's the term used in the mechanism for determining what sums must be paid and by when. That date for payment is then referred to as the final date for payment, but we'll come on to more of that later. The legislation also introduced concepts of payment notices. So these are notices by um, parties, the paying party, to effectively value the contractor's application for payment. It introduced the concept of withholding notices. Some of you might remember those as being notices which a paying party can serve, whereby they need to um, show an intention to pay less than the amount they originally valued. It also introduced the right for payee parties to suspend performance of their construction ob obligations where uh, the notified sums have not been paid by that final date for payment. There was a ban on pay when pay clauses other than in insolvency situations. And finally on this slide, a key feature of the Construction Act and the scheme was that where construction contracts failed to comply with these minimum requirements, those minimum requirements would then be implied into those construction contracts, effectively meaning it's not possible to contract out of these <clears throat> minimum requirements. Next slide, please. So after around 10 years of the original act, the government decided to make some changes in an ad attempt to address some um, key provisions that had been missed out or um, some key failings really of the original act and scheme. And this was principally the fact that there were no consequences for a paying party in failing to serve either that payment notice or a withholding notice. So this ultimately resulted in two new pieces of legislation, as we've referred to on the slide. Next slide, please. Looking then at the basics, there are a number of potential scenarios. The Construction Act firstly says that construction contracts have to provide an adequate mechanism for determining what payments become due and when. This includes certainty of the due date. Now, I mentioned earlier that bizarrely this isn't the date by which sums have to be paid, but it is actually a mechanism used in determining when that date for payment actually is. There must also be an obligation on the paying party to issue that payment notice within five days of the due date, and that period is fixed by the legislation. It, it can't be amended. There must then be certainty as to the final date for payment and an ability for the paying party to issue a pay less notice. If these minimum requirements are not met, as I've said, the legislation will effectively imply those minimum requirements to plug the gaps in deficient construction contracts. Finally, on this slide, it's worth noting that the payment mechanism has to be adequate, but it unfortunately doesn't have to be fair. So those 180 day payment terms, um, which some main contractors impose on their supply chain, while certainly frowned upon, unfortunately, they're not unlawful. Next slide, please. Looking then at the requirement of payment notices, as I've said, they must be served not later than five days after the due date for payment, and that period cannot be amended. As to the content, the notice must specify the sum that the paying party intends to pay, and 
most importantly, the basis upon which that has been calculated. That's particularly important where you are certifying less than the amount that the contractor has applied for. It's not sufficient simply to state the amount that you intend to pay, but you really must also show that working out. Now, if the notice is served out of time or it doesn't include the requisite detail, then it will be an invalid payment notice, the consequences of which are severe, which we'll come on to later. Next slide, please. Moving on then to look at pay less notices. If you've not come across these before, it was a new concept introduced by the New Construction Act um, and replaces the old withholding notices. They can be served by a paying party in various scenarios, for example, where they have failed to issue that first payment notice, effectively giving the paying party a second bite at the cherry to value the contractor's application for payment. Alternatively, they can be served where the paying party becomes aware of something which has arisen after the payment notice was served and they need to adjust the valuation. Finally, they can allow a paying party to make deductions from the notified sum uh, which were not, um, not necessarily dealt with in the payment notice themselves, so for example, a deduction of liquidated damages. In terms of timing, these notices need to be served not later than seven days before the final date for payment. And as to content, they must specify the sum that the paying party considers is due on the date that payless notice is served, rather than the, the due date for payment as with the payment notice. And again, they must show the basis upon which that sum has been calculated. It's the, showing you're working out here again is, is really important. And much like payment notices, a pay less notice which is served out of time or which doesn't include the requisite detail will be invalid. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Moving on then to look at the consequences of a failure of payment and pay less notices. If you get it wrong, as I've mentioned, the consequences are, are fairly disastrous. If there's no valid payment notice and no valid pay less notice, then the sum applied for becomes a sum which is due. And this was probably the biggest change that was introduced by the New Construction Act um, in 2011, and it was designed principally to ensure that the requirements to serve valid payment notices and pay less notices were meaningful and there were consequences for the paying party in failing to do so. Now, whilst it is possible to make an adjustment in a subsequent payment um, cycle, the employer will still have paid money out which was not due at that time, something which obviously is far from ideal. If that happens either at or near to practical completion, then there might not be sufficient balance of the contract sum left in order for the client to make that uh, to make the necessary deduction. The client's left in the unenviable position then of having to recover monies back from the contractor. That could ultimately pose an insolvency risk where the contractor goes bust before the client has been able to make that recovery. Any sum which hasn't been recovered then would represent an irrecoverable loss for the client. Next slide, please. So how does the scheme work? We've just included a simple graphic to illustrate the time scales and how the payment process that I've just described works in practice. This is the minimum requirement set out in the legislation and um, will ultimately be implied into non-compliant construction contracts. As you can see, the payment cycle under the scheme is very short at only 17 days from the due date for payment until the final date for payment. So it really is important for paying parties to make sure that their construction contracts do comply with those requirements to avoid the scheme being implied. Next slide, please. Moving on then from these minimum requirements, all industry standard forms have been drafted and updated to fit with these requirements, but some forms have subtle yet significant differences which are worth explaining. To illustrate that, we thought we'd look at both the JCT and NEC ECC forms of contract to demonstrate how that legislation has been translated into these key industry forms. Next slide, please. Firstly, then looking at the JCT, the one or one third first thing to mention is a small but important difference between the JCT design and build form of contract and the payment process under the JCT standard build of contract. And that is that the mechanism under the JCT design and build contract is valuation driven, whereas under the standard building contract, it's application driven. 
essentially this means that under a DNB form, an employer's agent will still be required to value a contractor's application for payment, even where the application for payment is served after the date specified by the contract. And this is because the JCT design and build form specifies that the due date for payment is calculated as either the date for the contractor's application in the contract or the date on which that um, payment application is actually received. So just moving on slightly, a term that's specific to the JCT forms of contract is that of the interim valuation date. Now the interim valuation date is specified in the contract particulars and it's usually the same date per month in contracts that have a monthly payment cycle. It's essentially the date by which a contractor is required to submit his application for payment. The due date is then calculated as being seven days after the interim valuation date. So already you can see payment cycle under the JCT forms of contract are going to be slightly longer than under the scheme due to the introduction of the notion of the interim valuation date. The payment notice, um, the requirement for that, it's still fixed as being five days from the due date for payment. We can't amend that, although it is possible to amend the final date for payment. Under the JCT forms, that's 14 days, but as I'm sure you can imagine, it's, it's something that employers tend to push back by way of a bespoke amendment in a schedule of amendments. Any pay less notice under a standard form design and build contract is required to be served no later than five days before the final date for payment. But again, that can be pushed back and is um, commonly amended in a schedule of amendments to not later than one day before the final date for payment, just to give the employer's agent or contract administrator a little bit more time. Ultimately, though, as we've said, if there's no payment notice or pay less notice, either valid or at all, then the sum applied for in the contractor's application for payment will be the sum that's payable. Next slide, please. So here we have a graphic just to show the mechanism I just described works on a timeline. As you can see, at 21 days, it's slightly longer than the um, overall payment cycle under the scheme, and that's due to the introduction of the interim valuation date. Now, the green line at the bottom of the slide highlights the point about a contractor making his application for payment late. So here, if the contractor submits his application for payment four days late, then it's still valid and the employer's agent must respond to it accordingly. It's just the timeline shifts slightly. Next slide, please. OK, so looking at the payment cycle under JCT standard building contract, we just have a, a diagram to illustrate how that works. I don't want to labour the points or dwell on this too long because the mechanism or the time frame, sorry, is exactly the same as under the design and build form. The only difference is that because it is an, app, um, an application driven process, the timescales for payment don't push back if, an, if the contractor submits his application for payment late. So the employer's agent will not be required to respond to a late payment application. Next slide, please. And again, please. Thank you. So moving on, we wanted to touch briefly on payment under the NEC for ECC form of contractors. We're conscious that some of you may use that from time to time. In summary, the timescales are the same as under the JCT forms of contract, specifically the standard building contract. And so this is an application-led payment process. But as you'll know, the NEC form uses slightly different terminology. So here we refer to the project manager rather than the employer's agent or contract administrator. And the interim valuation date is instead referred to as the assessment date. Next slide, please. Finally, then, we've included a diagram to illustrate the payment cycle under NEC for ECC. So other than terminology, it mirrors the approach under the JCT forms of contract, specifically the JCT standard form. So the due date for payment does not push back where the contractor submits his application for payment late. Next slide, please. Okay, so Stefan mentioned that we are including polls. So here's the first one. 
um, we have a retail client here who's procuring the refurbishment of an out-of-town shopping centre. The client appointed a contractor pursuant to an unamended JCT design and build contract. Works are progressing well. The contractor submits his application for payment in the sum of 1.25 million. The employer's agent issues a payment notice certifying the sum is due. A week before um, the final date for payment, they discover that some works need rectifying. The employer's agent returns to the office after a long weekend and issues a pay less notice one day before the final date for payment, stating an intention to deduct the sum of 350,000 from the um, amount due to the contractor. The employer pays the balance of 900,000 just before the final date for payment and the contractor decides to issue a speculative adjudication to recover that 350,000. The question is, will they be successful? Okay. Just wait for the results to come in. Okay, yes, so the majority are, are right. The, the key here was the timing of the pay less notice. So whilst it is possible to push this date back from the seven day maximum to not less than one day before the final date for payment, the unamended JCT contract requires any pay less notice to be served not later than five days before the final date for payment. So the payment um, pay less notice here was invalid and the contractor was entitled to the full amount claimed. Or, or certified in the payment notice. Next slide, please. Okay, now I won't steal John Sunder in terms of case update, but it would be remiss not to mention a couple of key cases when talking about payment. The first is that of Balfour Beatty and Grove Developments, which highlights the importance of allowing for additional payment dates in circumstances where the um, target completion date is not met. So in this case, the parties had included a very detailed payment schedule setting out all of the dates for payment um, calculated up to that target completion date. However, works on site were delayed by over a year and the courts held that in the absence of additional provisions, the contractor was not entitled to further interim applications for payment under that schedule they had to wait until the project was finished in order to um, recover additional monies. Moving on, so whilst invoices are a key requirement obviously for internal payment processes, the judge in the case of Rochford Construction and Killen confirmed that the final date for payment must be calculated from the due date for payment itself and not any other mechanism or circumstance in the contract excuse me, <clears throat> including the requirement for a valid VAT invoice. More recently, there have been two cases concerning the timing of applications for payment. The first case, A and B Building Solutions and J and B Hopkins, the judge concluded that dates set out in the payment schedule needed to be read in conjunction with other provisions in the contract, which were slightly conflicting. The effect of that was that a payment application received on a Monday, just one day after the date set out in the payment schedule, was not so late so as to render it an invalid payment application. And finally, the decision in Elements Europe and F&K Building clarifies that when calculating days for the purposes of construction contracts, and of course, unless the wording of the contract specifies otherwise, we mean whole days as opposed to merely business hours. This meant that an application for payment received at just after 10 o'clock was still a valid application for payment and so a failure by FK Building to respond to that application for payment at all rendered the whole amount claimed by the contractor as due. Now that's all from me on payment for the time being. I'm now going to hand you over to Richard Devoy. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, from me, and thank you, Katrina. Um, so, yes, I am going to be talking to you this morning uh, to give a brief introduction to the key concepts and principles behind delay analysis. Uh, we're going to go through some of those guiding principles. Uh, we're going to be going through some of the definitions and terminology that is often used within the delay analysis arena. 
we're going to be looking at some of the common types and methods that are available to uh, the delay analyst. And we're going to be then looking at some uh, simple examples of uh, an analysis in operation. If we could have the first slide, please. So within the world of delay analysis, we have a protocol uh, which is uh, referred to as the Society of Construction Law Delay and Disruption Protocol in its second edition, which is dated February 2017. Uh, as a document, it is uh, often referred to as a very sound starting point within the delay analysis arena. And it sets out for us some key concepts and some, some, some principles that are followed uh, in most cases when you are looking into the, the um, events of delay. Two key principles that are on the screen in front of you on this slide are cause and effect and effect and cause. You may have heard of these terms already, but what do they mean within the specific area of delay analysis? So firstly, cause and effect, um, aligning with uh, core principle four within the uh, protocol which is aimed at not waiting, not waiting and seeing what happens, i.e. Uh, performing some methods of analysis to look at a particular cause, which may be an instruction um, or an event that's occurred on a project, um, either a relevant event or something in a, in a contractual term, and then using that to model through your program what the likely effect of that cause may be. So you can see here that what we're doing is we're starting first with the cause, which as I've said, could be an instruction or some other event that uh, has the impact or has the, the potential to delay the works. And then from that cause, we are using our program of work to try and model what the likely impact as a hypothetical may be on the progress of the works. And if a critical delay, therefore the uh, completion date itself. Conversely, then the, the, the exact opposite to that uh, effect and cause, the difference between the two is that we're not first of all starting with the cause. What we have here is we have an effect that has played out as, uh, as a matter of fact, i.e. Uh, a delay itself has been identified within the progress of the works. And then from that known effect, what we are then seeking to establish is what the likely or the actual cause of that uh, effect or delay on the program is. So the, the key difference between the two is how they interplay with each other from a cause and effect perspective. One of them is a cause that, that, that has occurred, and then we're looking to see what the hypothetical or likely effect of that cause would be on the programme at the time it is occurring. The effect and cause is to establish what the cause to a known effect may be. And the effect and cause, as I say, with these guiding principles, is more aligned with core principle 11 of the protocol. Next slide, please. So you may have noticed on that previous slide, there were uh, references to prospective and retrospective um, wording uh, between those two, uh, two types of analysis. Um, and just to give you a definition of what we mean by those terms, prospective delay analysis is, is simply a method that is, light, is, is looking at the likely impact. So it's looking at what the future impact may be. Um, often uh, at the time it's being undertaken, obviously it's hypothetical because the impact that, that may be likely has not yet occurred. So when we say perspective, we're looking at events in the future that, that may impact or likely impact the progress of the works. And as I say, if it is on the critical path, likely to impact the date of completion. Retrospective then, as with the cause and effect and effect and cause, the retrospective is, is, the, is the exact opposite. The retrospective is the backwards looking, so to look back at what's actually happened to uh, identify from the facts that should be known what the actual impact of an event, uh, sorry, of, a, uh, of an event or a cause was on the, uh, the programme of work. Now, typically this will allow us to put together a, a much more fact-based um, analysis because uh, we're working on known facts, we're working on events that have already happened, we're working on uh, causes that have already happened, and we're working on uh, the basis that we know what the effect is. Often, you know, this is, this is carried out at the end of a project when, when the delay itself is known, and you look back to form an opinion on what the actual critical delay was. Next slide, please. 
so within the protocol itself, having established um, uh, a, a definition for cause and effect, effect and cause, prospective and retrospective, what you can see on screen are six very common methods used within delay analysis. This again is within the protocol. And what we have in front of us is identifying the methods that can be undertaken to suit either a cause and effect, prospective or retrospective method of analysis, depending on when it is that you are wanting to seek to determine either the likely impact, as we've talked about, or the actual impact, again, as, as, as we've discussed. There is one more word in here I would draw your attention to, which is the contemporaneously um, word set out for methods two, three, and four in that table. Um, and very briefly, as a, as a simple definition, that that would mean at the time it is occurring for the purposes of, of, of what we're looking at within the protocol here. So on that table, you can see the six methods, the names of those methods that are on the left-hand side there, the type, which is the cause and effect, which will now hopefully be relatively familiar to you as to what that means. Similarly, as with all of these methods of analysis, what it is that we're looking at, we're trying to determine critical path and delay to that critical path, which is essentially giving us route for uh, extending extensions to dates for completion, if it is critical delay. And then in the final column, we have uh, a list of typical documents that are required to undertake in any or all of those methods of analysis. And we will come on to some of those records um, a bit later on. Uh, but for now, all I would say is primarily what is required is a program. Often when, when performing analysis, it is done against a bar chart program with, with the software that is available to uh, the industry and uh, various types of this analysis. Some of them will be dynamic, which will mean it will rely on the network, the completed network within those, um, within those programs that have been put together. And some of them will, will rely less on the network within the program and more on the analyst's view from a static position, i.e. a drawn out actual against plan. We'll come on to uh, some of these uh, methods very shortly um, to go for a very simple, simple example. Next slide, please. So records. Uh, records, 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 as you will see, they're very, very important to be kept uh, and very important part of, of, of requirements to perform any method of analysis, really. Um, they're not in any particular order, um, but they are, well, neither is, is this an exhaustive list, um, but typical requirements. Contract, obviously, you know, we, we must pay attention to what our contract is telling us or leading us to in terms of any analysis requirements that are defined within there or what should be done. Similarly, you know, contract that will, that will take us to uh, mechanisms for um, uh, entitlement to time, which is often what we're looking at from a delay analysis perspective. And when we're putting these together, we will need the contemporaneous information such as progress reporting, uh, percentage reporting for progress against the program, instructions, variations and changes, so events that are occurring that we're going to need to, to, to be able to look at as the cause of delays, whether it is a retrospective look back or whether it's a, whether it's a prospective look forward. And often correspondence in the form of emails, letters, certificates, um, notices, etc., will allow us to establish what the likely uh, reason for that cause of delay is. Very important, as I say, to make sure that we have uh, set in place a, a way of keeping records for the project. Next slide, please. So here we have the second poll for the day, uh, a question to pose to you. The contractor receives an instruction from the employer in week two of their contract program. They believe that the instruction will likely have an impact on the progress of the works and therefore completion and seeks to model a likely effect of the event at the time it is occurring by employing a delay analysis. So in this scenario, is this method a prospective method or a retrospective method? We will just give a few seconds for people to make decisions.
see what we think. Very good. Yes, certainly most of you there are correct. So what is happening there is uh, 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 an event has occurred very early on in the program. The contractor uh, has, has uh, a cause to think that that, that that event is likely to delay the progress of the works. And what they're seeking to do there is, is to establish or model a view on what the likely impact of that event is, you know, what the likely uh, delay to the program may be. So the correct answer there is perspective. If we could have the next slide, please. So, to give you a brief, uh, simple example of a method of analysis, what we have here is a cause and effect perspective method of analysis. So, we are here uh, in the example uh, from the poll that we've just given. We are looking at um, a, a cause that has occurred and we're seeking to determine what the likely effect of that cause or the event is on the program. So with this method, we are going to need a logic-linked baseline program. We're going to be using the completed network within that program to try and reschedule and establish what the likely impact may be. And obviously, we, then need, we therefore need a selection of delay events, which could be uh, any number of them in a series or a single event that we can use to model through the likely impact of this program. You can see on here we've got eight activities from start through to completion and we've got the black arrows that are at the end of each of the activity bars finish to start relationships with their succeeding or successor activity. A very simple sequence of works. What we will do in this scenario, if we can move through to the next slide please, is we would take our event, which you can see at the top of the bar chart there. So we have an event that has occurred at the end of week two. We would plot into our program what we think at the time this is occurring, the likely resolution for that event is. You can see in this instance, it is likely to be a three week uh, duration. And we then link that, that, that event through to the constrained activity that would be in its constrained position as a result of this event that has occurred. So you can see what we've done here is we've introduced some new logic to the program on the completion of the event itself. We've drawn a link back down to the affected activity, which is now in its displaced or constrained position. Essentially, this is modeling the fact that activity C cannot start until we have the uh, until we have resolved this particular delay event. Having modeled that through and, and rescheduled the program relying on the software, so relying on the network uh, logic link that, that is within it, what it is telling us is that the likely event, without any further mitigation measures um, as a tool to try and recover, is, is to be a two week and two day impact to the date of completion. And we would be able to use this model, uh, this, this model scenario to uh, advise in, in, the, in the position of the contractor, advise the employer under the contract if we were contractually bound to provide notices, for example, that an event has occurred, we can give notice that, that we consider that event is likely to have an impact on completion, and we can give them the analysis to back up how we've arrived at what it is we are telling them the effect of this delay is. Again, um, in, 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 um, in simple terms, it's giving us the information that we need as well as keeping the records that we may have to rely on in the future if we are seeking to, uh, to establish an entitlement to, uh, to, to an extended date for completion. Uh, next slide, please. So, in summary, what we've been through this morning, um, if you should find yourselves in a position where a method of delay analysis is required, we have, we have gone through um, very briefly, I, I'm aware, but we've been through the types of analysis that are available to us and the methods of the analysis that, that flow from those two different types. Remember the types being the cause and effect, perspective and retrospective. And those methods as, as, as identified within the protocol that, that seek to determine the impact of the delay and the critical path prospectively and retrospectively. Very importantly, we have established that we need to consider the contractual provisions as to what we may have to do or where the contract may direct us in terms of analysis requirements. 
And certainly we've been through the importance of the records that are required to perform the analysis to help us articulate the findings of, of, of what that analysis is telling us. Uh, and the final slide, please. So just to give you some further information and some reading if you, if you should uh, wish to review, two links here for you which will be available on the slides that are, are going to be circulated round. The first is the protocol, which as I referred to at the start of this presentation is the Society of Construction Law Delay and Disruption Protocol. Um, it's not a short document, but it is there to, to, give, a gu to give guidance and it, and it will be very, very informative for anybody who is seeking to look at methods of analysis that may need to be employed. And the second link is uh, the CIB Planning Protocol 2021. I should say both of these documents are freely available to download through these links. Um, and what this document, again, as a protocol or guidance note is trying to do is to establish a level of robustness and quality throughout programs should they need to be relied on for the dynamic rescheduling as we talked about i.e the use of the program software itself to determine critical path and likely impact uh, on, on any sequence of the project uh, these will both be available to you you don't need to try and scroll them down uh, scroll them down um, sorry scroll them down on, on a piece of paper now uh, and uh, thank you very much for listening i am now going to hand you over to uh, John, uh, for the case law updates. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. I'll try and follow that. It was rather interesting, so I'm not sure I'll live up to it. Um, next slide, please. Let's start this section with a poll. So, how long do you think that cases are taking to get to trial in England and Wales at the moment? We're talking about the bigger cases here, so multi track and fast track cases. Let's see how cynical everybody here is. Okay. So the majority of you, or the largest number of you, plumping for 52 weeks, and I'm afraid to say it is 80. Um, recent statistics have shown that it is taking that period of about 18 months to get a matter to trial. Um, smaller matters, small claims track ones, are getting there in about 52 weeks. So just bear that in mind as we go through these case law updates that 18 months worth of work, time, money has gone into getting them. So the next court update we've got for you is a new track coming. The court has long had a set of three tracks under which it deals with claims and it's adding another one. This will be a track that deals with claims up to £100,000 in value and of reasonable complexity but not the most complex. The key feature of this is that there's going to be a fixed recoverable costs arrangement so you will only be able to recover a fixed sum irrespective of how much it costs you to get to trial on these claims. It's going to serve a new landscape for efficiency in smaller claims. And then the final point on this slide, increasingly we're seeing judges using AI. It's everywhere now, isn't it? But um, we are aware that they're using ChatGPT to prepare judgments, as we understand it at the moment. It's only to prepare summaries of events and principles but we should still keep an eye on it for any inconsistencies. Next slide please. So the first of our actual case law updates, uh, this one is a Scottish case. So it's still binding, it's not binding sorry on the uh, courts of England and Wales but it is still influential particularly because the subject matter of this claim was the enforcement of adjudications and the court in Scotland takes an extremely similar approach. So the, the key elements of this case were that the uh, defendant sought to avoid paying a, an adjudication 
decision. And they sought to do that on the basis that the adjudicator had determined the dispute based in part on submissions that hadn't been made by the parties and had come from his own thinking. The court had then went on to find that that wasn't a breach of natural justice because it was only part of the path to the answer rather than being the answer to the question uh, as a whole. So worth noting there that really it is quite difficult to resist the enforcement of adjudications, even if something slightly untoward has happened during the course of the adjudication. Next slide, please. So having just said that it's difficult to enforce adjudications, um, or it's difficult to resist enforcing adjudications, I come to one where that was successfully done. Worth noting that this one very much turns on its own facts. So in this case, the contractor made an application for payment eight years after the works had been completed. The works were done under a standard, uh, under a normal contract, so not a deed, therefore with a limitation period of six years. And the adjudicator was willing to make a decision on that, but the court was unwilling to enforce it on the basis that uh, there was no jurisdiction because of the limitation issue, and there was a limitation effect on the ability to bring an adjudication. As I say, that's a very unusual case, and even um, slightly goes contrary to uh, the way that limitation is usually calculated, in that here the uh, judge determined that limitation started to run from the uh, accrual of the payment dispute rather than from the uh, end of the works, which is really what we have come to accept as the norm. Next case, please. So this again is an adjudication enforcement claim and it dealt with an adjudication following a non-payment of an interim payment. This case shows you why multiple adjudications aren't always the best way to deal with various issues between parties. So the main contractor didn't pay because they wanted to set off other decisions made by another, other adjudicators, including those on other projects against this uh, decision that was being enforced. The judge considered the authority on it, which largely comes from the case at the bottom of the slide there, HS Works and uh, Enterprise, and determined that they would not allow the set off on the basis that it didn't meet the tests. Next slide, please. So the tests for setting off adjudication decisions are four stage tests. So Firstly, the court would look at whether or not both decisions are valid. Um, if a decision isn't valid, then the court obviously won't use it to set off. Then the court will look at whether both decisions are capable of being enforced or given effect to. And then the court will look at whether it wants to give effect to those and exercise its discretion uh, into the final stage. The third stage is a key one here, really, because the parties have to have issued enforcement proceedings in order to be able to rely on a set-off arrangement, and here the parties haven't done that. Um, so the key takeaway here really is not only is it difficult to do that, but if you want to do it, you need to get your ducks in a row uh, and deal with the procedural elements of it as well, get the claim issued so that it can be dealt with simultaneously by the court. Uh, next slide, please. So now on to a JCT insurance issue, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen floating around. Uh, this is the Court of Appeals decision on this case following a previous High Court decision on it. Um, the court was considering whether or not 
the insurer under a joint names insurance policy could bring a claim uh, against uh, the contractor on the basis that certain elements of the works were defective. Uh, in short, the court determined that the co-insurance defence was not available to the contractor in these circumstances because the uh, workmanship aspect which the claim was being pursued under was not part of the uh, insured uh, risks and therefore uh, the co-insured defence could not be run. Worth noting that there had been an element of the uh, losses suffered by the RFU here which were covered by that but they weren't being sought in these proceedings. Um, it is important, therefore, when you're looking at your claims, uh, whether or not you can try and differentiate different elements of the claim and defend them potentially differently. Next, uh, next slide, please. Finally, one that Katrina touched on earlier, um, which is the case of elements in FK building. Uh, this was a, a payment dispute relating to the failure to send a pay less notice following an application for payment. Uh, Elements sent an application late in the day, seven minutes past 10 at night, um, and FK sought to argue that, that application was served too late because the site working hours should have applied. The contract didn't say that, it only referred to days. Uh, and therefore the court's approach was to interpret a day as a day um, on the basis that that's what the contract said. That meant that the payment application was valid and the sums had to be paid. The key takeaway here is that if you want to limit the times available to send these sort of documents, provide for effective service, you need to make sure that the contract actually reflects what you're intending. Um, so that's the end of the case law update. Worth noting that quite a few of these have got um, articles relating to them on our website. So if you want to read them in a bit more detail, uh, do go to our website and find our updates on the construction and engineering side and you'll find, as I say, updates on various of these cases. Uh, for now, I'll hand back to Stefan, who I think is going to uh, deal with our Q&A session. That's great. Thank you very much, John. Uh, and yes, as John says, we've got some time now for some questions and some questions have been coming in. So thank you very much for those. But if I start with one for you, Katrina, on payment. Um, so question here, you mentioned that if the payment provisions in your contract do not comply with the Act, the scheme for construction contracts will imply terms. Does this mean you can no longer rely on the payment provisions in your contract and that the scheme applies instead? Thank you, um, Stefan. So that's is an interesting point. Um, the scheme and the legislation doesn't apply as a wholesale amendment to the payment provisions in the construction contract, but they will effectively plug the elements that are deficient. So if the payment mechanism is generally compliant, but for example, you have amended the date for the payment notice, um, you may provides that that's 10 days after the due date for payment, then the legislation will correct that error. So it will amend that back to, to five days and otherwise leave the balance of the contractual mechanism as is. Understood, thank you very much. Um, John, probably a question for you here, um, which has come in in advance, which was around NEC4 and decided cases. So. Have there been any judgments yet handed down through the TCC, so the Technology and Construction Court, on payment claims under the NEC 4 suite of contracts? Not that we're aware so far. This is something we're constantly monitoring. We've seen I think, the most recent cases on the NEC suite uh, were back in 2020, 2021. Those were on the NEC 3 still. 
Um, not sure why this is happening. It may be a factor of the court delays that we were talking about earlier, or it might be the collaborative approach that the contract is trying to push forward. So we'll have to see how those develop. As I say, we're keeping an eye. Good stuff. Thank you, John. A question for you, Richard, here on programming. So how important is a robust program if being used for delay analysis purposes? Uh, yes, good question. So we touched on that in the presentation. Um, certainly, if, if you are going to need to use your program uh, in the prospective method to try and determine what the likely uh, effect of, of, of any event or cause or delay is uh, on that, it's very important, certainly, to establish both that the results you're getting from that method are, are accurate and you know, reflect some level of reality, uh, as well as being able to rely on the software to determine critical path, for example, which is a key component of, of, of what uh, what the performance of the delay analysis try, is trying to establish. There is more detail on, on, on quality with programs and robustness within the um, planning protocol, which is provided uh, as a free download. Very good. Thank you, Richard. Um, Katrina, I'll come back to you. Another question here on payment. Um, sort of methods of service as well. So the question is, can I issue payment notices and applications by email? Uh, yes, uh, it's certainly um, easiest to, isn't it? I would say when it comes to this, it's really important to follow what the contract says. So you can specify in the contract particulars or the um, contract data if the parties accept service by email. So if those provisions have been completed, then yes, absolutely you can, but just make sure you serve to the address specified or if another address has subsequently been notified. Um, but it is always best just to follow up a, with a copy um, in the post as, as normal. Okay, thank you, Katrina. Um, John, one for you here. So you said that regarding the HS Works case, multiple adjudications might not be the best way to achieve resolution when there are multiple disputes. What would you suggest instead, or what would you consider when deciding on the best approach? Yeah, I mean, this is always part of our initial review of claims as to whether or not we want to run it through adjudication or we want to look at the alternatives, either litigation or arbitration, depending on what provisions apply in the contract, particularly if you've got an arbitration clause, sometimes it is possible to agree a, a short form arbitration, which is a sort of halfway measure between uh, an adjudication and an arbitration that might give you an answer to more than one dispute without the jurisdictional issues that come with that and give you a final answer as well. Excellent, thank you. Um... Katrina, back to you. We've got a minute or two left. Uh, I'll just quickly rattle through a couple more. Um, so we have a JCT Minor Works contract. It's only three weeks long, the programme duration. It seems that interim monthly payments could be overkill. Can we do stage payments of, say, 50% on signing and 50% on completion? Okay. Um, that's really interesting. We didn't actually discuss that on this in the presentation, but the entitlement to interim payments under construction contracts applies if the construction period is over 45 days. So here you wouldn't necessarily even have to do interim payments. You could pay the contractor at the end. Um, alternatively, stage payments would be appropriate. So you may, you would have to specify in the contract particulars um, or amend the the, the relevant payment provisions and you could provide for payment either on placing the contract and then on on completion of the works so that's probably what i would do very good thank you all right time for just one more question um it's a claims related question so i'll, I'll direct this one to you john if that's okay um yeah. so it's not always in the interest sorry is it not always in the interest of the client to wait and assess claims later once all the facts are available, assuming liquidated and ascertained damages for delay are insignificant? I mean, the answer is yes, if you've got the luxury of doing that. 
there are plenty of circumstances where that isn't an option. For instance, if you've got concerns about liquidity of the other party, if you think they might be heading down the drain, you need to get an answer soon to avoid a payment that's just going to disappear into the ether. Um, but generally, bringing claims when you know what the facts are and you've got the facts available to sustain them is going to be better. It's just that this industry doesn't always allow it. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I suppose just to supplement that, I guess depends a little bit what the contract says too. You know, if it's an NEC form of contract, as I'm sure lots of the audience will know, it, there are provisions in there which sort of incentivize and motivate the parties to sort of deal with things as they come up and contemporaneously and the sort of condition precedent type clauses. So yeah, as John says, helpful to wait if you can from the client's point of view, but sometimes as John mentioned, not you don't always have that um, that luxury. Oh, sorry, clauses about finality of certificates and the like, you need to run the dispute within a certain number of days after that certificate is issued, then you've just got to get on with it. Yeah, absolutely. Great stuff. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. We are at just past quarter two, so I will wrap things up there. Um, so all that kind of remains for me to kind of cover really is to say thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, I hope you found um, the session informative. Um, when you finish the session, when the session ends, you'll be invited to submit your feedback um, through the GoToWebinar platform um, and provide sort of suggestions as well for things that you might want to hear about in future sessions. If you're able to take a minute just to complete that exercise, um, we'd be grateful. We always find it immensely helpful to hear from, from you as to what you want us to talk about on future sessions. So yeah, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you again to the CICES team for inviting us to uh, speak with you this morning. Um, have a good day and we hope to see you next time.